Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 274, featuring the fourth and final installment of my interview with Ms. Susan Manley of Old School. And this is the last part of the interview we talk about uh, the Imagination Network, a very early online gaming platform, pre-internet stuff. It's really interesting. And Susan knows a lot of the uh, technical stuff uh, behind all that, uh, which is really fascinating. Uh, we also talk about a game called Mat uh, Mattel. Uh, Mattel's uh, Barbie Super Sports uh, game. Uh, <laughs> probably not a, a game you've, you've uh, played before, but some pretty interesting stuff about that too. A lot of cool behind the scenes stuff. And then uh, we wrap up with a, uh, a platform, a technology, I guess, that Susan helped develop called the Expresso uh, Fitness System. This is a interactive exercise system supposed to make exercise fun. Anyway, a lot of great stuff here. So without further ado, here is Miss Susan Manley. All right, so just a few last questions. Okay. Uh, most of which are about the Imagination Network. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, something I'd like to know a lot more about. Okay. So maybe just start off, you know, what was it? And then oh. uh, what happened to it? <laughs> the Imagination Network. This is really cool because it started long before I ever got there. Um, and it started, apparently, uh, Ken Williams, who was the founder of Sierra Online, wanted a way for him and his mom to be able to play bridge so playing computer games online across the country together okay um so they created the system to do it and then they started creating um like a land a place where you could play several different types of games and you went to different areas to play the different types of games and it ended up being card and board games and eventually they had action products they had a a, a flight simulator called red baron um they had uh each one of the lands was themed and it was supposed to draw different demographics of people Anyhow, um, I got there just after the whole company had been sold to AT&T. And AT&T thought that it was going to be part of their retention strategy to keep consumers using AT&T. Um, and then they decided that they weren't going to do that. <laughs> so we, um, I arrived right after the deal had been inked. And the deal that they had purchased um, Imagination Network for had included so much um, prepaid development time from Sierra Online to develop some more games to release. Well, at the time, there were a lot of different online gaming systems. There were places like Kesmai and a couple of others. And the games there's a couple different types of online games and the games that Sierra were making were more like the land type games to made to be played on a local network, not on an internet. And so they didn't have the, you know, they, they, they were not used to dealing with as much latency as we would deal with. They were not used to dealing with the number of players that we would want to put into a product. Um, and so we had these great big epic games that we wanted to put on the system, um, but we had to be able to spawn many instances of them and support them all and allow people to meet up and actually find each other to play against each other, and the list goes on. Um, was this pre? This was pre-internet, or? Um, actually, this is pre-internet. Um, Imagination Network was a dial-up service when I got there. Um, we re-architected the system and created a, an entirely new platform on Win95 to release. And, it, and um, at the time, too, we also got um, bought by AOL. We were planning to be internet Win95 service um, prior to that. And then all of a sudden we were Win95 service underneath AOL and dealing with an entirely different design principle once again. 
Um, and not just um, latency issues then, but like extreme latency issues because AOL people were almost all on dial-up at the time um, because that was how people got their internet service when they didn't have um, DSL, which you needed to be close into a service to have DSL. You couldn't be out in the, the urban regions. Um, as a matter of fact, I know that for a fact because I had to get uh, long distance DSL where I lived and that didn't come along for a while because I happened to live on a hillside and even though I was where all of the quote-unquote wealthy people were, they were not installing um, cable access up there for the longest time. So anyhow, um, the AOL players wanted downloadable games, and AOL also wanted downloadable games. So all of these great big games that we had in production for Imagination Network were all CD distribution, graphically intensive things like Mission Force Cyberstorm. Um, we had Trophy Bass. Did you do any work on the Neverwinter Nights? No, I did, no, I did not work on Neverwinter Nights. I'm well aware of it, but I never actually did any work on it. Cool stuff, though. Mm -hmm. So notice when you say AOL bought it out, you didn't exactly seem cheerful <laughs> on that point. It, well, it was just, hard. It was hard yeah. because everything that we had been building towards to create this service where you could connect up and play long distance, kind of like an early version of a Steam, in, but you know, you'd have to distribute DVDs to people, um, instead um, ended up being downloadable assets and so most of the, the products that I was working on were you know null and void and it was hard um, and to try and put an action product through AOL's service um, at the time the architecture was that all packets between players got sent to AOL in the East Coast and then came back the latency issues were doubled you know they didn't allow for UDP only, um, oh gosh, TCP IP. So you think that's probably where they went wrong with, with it? Well, there are security issues. Um, they, there was a lot of discussion with our engineers about creating a new flavor of UDP that was a blend of TCP IP. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about, by the way? I've seen these letters arranged ah, in that sequence before. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, as a producer, I get to know a lot more about all of the magic things that make games work. It's like when you have to open up ports <laughs> on your router and it's, you know, UDP <laughs> or whatever. TCP IP is a packet protocol that allows the computer to send a message and then send another message that says, did you get that? When the other res machine responds back with what's called an ACK, then it can send the next message. An ACK? Well, an, yeah. <laughs> ACK. So you've heard the term ACK probably. Uh, an no, ACK is, <laughs> it's, a, it's a confirmation. Anyhow, TCP IP literally requires an ACK for every piece of information that it sends. And it sends them in these little concise bytes, which means that it's really slow because it has to do twice the trip in order to put the next piece of information out. UDP says, I'm just going to blast you with this whole bunch of stuff. Here's a packet. 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 Oh, did you get all that? <laughs> yes. Here's some more. <laughs> so it, it doesn't have twice the trip for each piece of information. And that, that was the big difference. It was a speed issue as far as the round trips. And because literally when you're connecting up all of these people that live all the way across the country and everything had to go get funneled from AOL and then back out again, that was where the problems were. Um, this is where distributed cloud um, support came into being because you needed to put game servers on both the East Coast and the West Coast and in the middle of the country and so that it could route the packets appropriately. Yeah, I remember back when AOL was sending out those little canisters. <laughs> <laughs> I think I probably still have a couple of boxes full of those things. We used to make coasters out of all of our dead 
um, DVDs and our dead CDs. Actually, we, uh, John Manley and I had, we were really funny. Um, Electronic Arts would have a dead bin for all of the products that were bad. So we would pick up all of the deluxe paint ones and make them in the coasters on our table at home. And of course, it was a $500 paint package. So people would freak out because we were putting our coffee on our discs. And we'd be like, no, really, they're dead discs. And they're like, they they just, it couldn't compute, you know. And now we realize that that was a, a five-cent piece of plastic. But uh, we used to do that with the DVDs, too. Make them into coasters. It really tweaks people's brains. <laughs> so, Jack, it's just to wrap up here. I noticed you also worked on a Mattel uh, Barbie sports game. Yes, I did. But after you took a little hiatus from the gaming industry and then came back for that? I mean, what was it about that that made you want to come back? Um, I actually got a plea call from um, Jessica Durchin, <laughs> who was a friend of a friend of mine, um, Gaino Hain. And Jessica needed somebody to go stop into the development house up out in San Francisco and figure out what the heck was going on and whether the product was actually getting done. Um, and this is actually one of those cases where the engineer was doing all of the art processing and I let them know. But I also got to know a lot about why Mattel wasn't really effective at getting their products out. Apparently, this product was hitting alpha and they still didn't have a signed contract which meant that the developer was getting no development money or support, just a lot of deadlines. <laughs> um, and they also had no guarantee that they actually had a deal, which is the other thing that was pretty amazing to me that anybody would actually develop under that premise. But what the developer did to limit their risk was they literally, after getting the art done, they only had one person on the project who was the engineer who was leading all of the development for it, but he was actually doing all of the art processing too. And it was one of the reasons why Alpha was getting later and later because he was trying to process all of the art into the game instead of having a junior person anywhere doing that. But they had all of those junior people all off on paying products. <laughs> well, how do you feel about the concept of Barbie sports game? Actually, I thought it was a cool idea. Um, the They had uh, snowboarding and all of these really great 3D rendered art Barbie characters, and they were actually really well done. Um, I thought it was odd that that there couldn't be like an intermixed game where you had both male and female players, you know, and I guess, you know, it would have had been Barbie and Ken or whatever, but they decided to make girl centric games at the time. And a lot of people did that by going to the extremes, which, you know, it's, it's, it's either, you know, it's Barbie and it's pink or, you know, <laughs> or it's, it's, gi joe and it's green and you know and and camo and, and they're shooting and death and blood and guts and gore and there's like no happy medium it, you know in the games and i was kind of surprised and i you still see that a lot actually where there's like no middle ground where things are not pink or blue <laughs> yeah what color is halfway between pink and blue uh something probably muddy and ugly <laughs> <laughs> But you know what I mean. It, it, oh, yeah, they, yeah. they have a hard time making things that appeal to both, and I think that that's silly. There's certainly lots of other things that you can do, or you can intersperse, you know, things that that would appeal to both. Um, in a game. Yeah, it seems to come back to what we were talking about with the curse of the Azure Bonds and those. <laughs> well, the, you know, we have to cater to our audience, which is almost all male. But your audience yeah. will only always all exactly. be exactly. And actually, nowadays, the computer game playing audience is actually largely female. So it's switched. It's changed quite a bit. It depends on which uh, particular platform you're talking about, but there are a lot more female players nowadays. So I thought we could end with this note. I, I really enjoyed your confessions of a was it confessions of a, confessions of a game developer or something like that. Oh, confessions of a video game designer. A video game designer piece, and uh, you know, at the end of that, you're talking about how video game designers are like chefs. You know, which that kind of caught my attention. I thought that was really good, you know, metaphor. And you, you know, a good chef obviously has to sample and taste not just the dishes, but the, all the ingredients that go into it. You, just, you have. Yeah, you I wanted to, to elaborate a little bit on this uh, this image. Sure. Um, 
I think of it as you have to get in to the heart of the technology and make sure that you're doing the, the processes the best that they can be. You're using the best tools so that you can get um, things envisioned the best. You have to be extremely creative with how you envision how a product will work. Many times games are not underneath what they seem to be on the surface. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors that go on. And so if you actually did what you could only act, if, if everything was real physics, it would be real boring. Just like in a role-playing game, we don't put in the bathroom and the kitchen, you know, because <laughs> those are not the fun parts of playing the game. You don't want to think about that while you're playing a game. You want to go around and destroy monsters and have epic adventures and find treasure. Yay, save the princess. You know, you don't want to do the mundane things. And uh, they, although they build mundane things in and they call it grinding, it's not the most fun part of the aspects of the game. Um, you want that kind of that roller coaster ride. And so in order to do that, the, whoever is managing the product and uh, helping to envision the product really needs to get into what can the technology do, what can be displayed, what is the most compelling thing that players want to think that they are actually doing. And, you know, you want that rush and it has to come on a fairly regular basis because that's your reward. I just accomplished something amazing. Um, and the something amazing can't be I p p pressed the A button, a, you know, 40 times in a row. I mean, it, that's... Yeah, just collected know, 12 bear asses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It needs to be a little more elaborate than that. There's, there is a mental game on top of the mental game, and it's not just a physical game. And th it's true also for the way that, that we envision the games in themselves, you know, are we using the best technology to display what it is that we want to display? Um, will the player actually get that feeling of being there? Will they be, you know, will it, will it supersede all of the other stimulus in the room? And that's when you know you really have a game because people are not paying attention to anything else going on. They're busy doing the game. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an excellent way to end this I think is there anything else you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to um, anything you want to mention I, I know you've done the espresso thing and the espresso fitness is actually a way to take people's minds off of exercising through, through sort of playing a game um, it's more of a simulation than I would have wanted it to be um, the espresso bike is in fitness clubs everywhere and uh, they are still out there, but they're not doing as well as we had hoped. Um, it was supposed to make exercise fun, though. Instead of instead of playing hamster wheel and watching little LED right, lights race up, depending on how much you know your heart rate was going up or you know what incline you were going up on a stationary bike, it was supposed to be adventuring in real places and having the ability to play some minor games along the way or even just race yourself in your last instance or keep up with the pacer or race the other virtual players. And it was supposed to allow, say, you and I to both get on a stationary bike in, in two different places in the world and go have a ride together and be able to talk to each other. That sounds cool to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's you know what? The biggest motivation for exercise is actually to go to the gym with a friend. And so because you got to you got to show up. Your friend's going to be there, right? <laughs> Um, and the other thing that makes it fun is when you're not thinking about the exercise, but you're instead having some sort of an adventure. It's just like with the games, you get into a Zen mode. So that was what Espresso was supposed to be. Was making I was it going to drive my spell checker insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't name the company. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. Hope I'll see you guys next week. We do have uh, uh, the first week of classes uh, starting tomorrow, though, so I'm going to have to be uh, have to be sort of uh, iffy about whether there'll be an episode. It just kind of depends on how that uh, first week goes and if I get uh, too swamped. Uh, but hopefully I'll have time to put out a, a new retrospective. And as always, appreciate your uh, suggestions as for games you'd like to see me review on the show. And as always, I want to thank you very, very much from the absolute rock bottom of my heart for your support. Continued support of Matt Chat really means a lot to me, guys. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, just go to the Patreon site in the show notes. It takes about uh, 30 seconds to set that up. Any amount, whatever you think the show is worth, 
Really appreciate it. Plus, that'll give you some access to some special podcasts, Google Hangouts, and a bunch of other really cool stuff. And uh, by the way, uh, I don't know if you've... Uh, I've mentioned this before, but we do have transcripts now available for these uh, interview episodes. I just go to the Patreon site and you can download those. And you don't even have to, uh, to be a supporter to get the transcripts. So uh, thank everyone for that continued support. All right, let's see. What about the news from the Mad Cave? Uh, quite a few items here. Uh, one is uh, pretty interesting. Beam Dog is working on a new Baldur's Gate game. Apparently the mysterious adventure Y. Um, and this is a, this game will be set in between Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. So there's definitely a lot of room in there for some good stories. Really, uh, it's a great idea, I think. And just in case you haven't heard of Beamdog, uh, they've been doing the enhanced editions of these games. And they're actually, uh, they were founded by two Bioware guys. I think a programmer, uh, I think the other guy might have been a producer. <laughs> I didn't write that down. But anyway, they had some experience with Bioware games besides these enhanced edition so stay tuned for that uh, should be pretty good uh, and then a uh, thamer a longtime supporter of the show uh, sent in some news about a game upcoming uh, kickstarter project called children of morta this is a narrative based roguelike uh, developed by dead mage looks like it's going to be very story narrative driven kind of unusual for a roguelike game and that kickstarter is going up on the 20th uh, so i'll try to uh, mention that again when the uh, when that comes out. And then uh, finally, just a cool uh, thing that arrived uh, this week, uh, from, from Bedrooms to Billions. Uh, this is a new DVD. Haven't even had time to uh, watch this. Haven't even <laughs> taken it out of the plastic yet. Uh, but this is apparently sort of like the gameplay of the movie that we did uh, sort of thing, but it's about the uh, UK and uh, that side of things. So it's got the BBC Micro, uh, ZX Spectrum, the Amiga Atari ST. They got interviews in here by Mark Healy, Ian Livingston, Peter Molino, Jeff Minter, uh, David Braben, uh, David Perry, Mark Cerny. Uh, so a lot of uh, big names. Really looking forward to watching this, but I <laughs> haven't had time to yet, but I still thought it was worth mentioning. Actually, it supported their uh, Kickstarter, uh, so I think this is uh, how I got this. Uh, hopefully you guys uh, supported it too. If not, I'm sure you can find some way to, to order it. All right, what about that ale of the week? Ah, uh, well... Uh, this week, <laughs> uh, maybe this will be good. I, I got this in a variety pack. I'm not usually a big fan of the Pilsners, uh, but I thought, you know, what the heck, I thought I'd give this a try <laughs> since I've got it. <laughs> uh, this is Summit Brewing Company, and they call this a Bohemian style. And I, I mean, Summit usually makes a pretty good beer. Uh, they're based in St. Paul, so just right up the, right down the road, about an hour away. Um, unfortunately, they don't really put anything about this on here anywhere. Like alcohol content, I would assume since it's a pilsner, it's probably 4.5 or you know, maybe even a 4 percent. Usually not very strong. Uh, but anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this uh, Summit Pilsner Bohemian style here in this rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> well, it smells nice. Got sort of a honey. I like smell a little bit of that uh, sort of corn flakes uh, like aroma that you get with these uh, pilsners. Definitely smell the sort of malty uh, aromas in this. But it doesn't smell bad. I'll go ahead and give it a try. Yeah, definitely. You know, I just don't know why folks like these pills nurses. It just always tastes like a really soggy cornflakes to me. <laughs> Not a whole lot of a, a lot of other flavors here. Never been my favorite style. It's uh, very watery. It's not a lot of flavor other than that sort of cornflake-like uh, thing. You know, I guess maybe that's fine for uh, Pilsner's fans, though, so I don't, I don't want to knock it too hard, but it's just not, not my favorite style. But, you know, this would be good, I guess, if it's a really... If you're out on a hot summer day, you don't want to get drunk. <laughs> you don't want to have a, you know, a heat stroke or something by uh, getting dehydrated. You know, maybe these more watery uh, beers like this would be, be a good thing. Uh, just not really uh, uh, something I'm interested in. This I'm going to go uh, uh, one out of five uh, drinking horns on this. You know, it is a pilsner, <laughs> so I kind of knew I wasn't going to like this. But you know, you know how it is. You get those variety packs, and you don't want to just waste alcohol. I mean, it's alcohol abuse. So, all right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotations about exercise after hearing about uh, Susan's espresso fitness machines. 
And I found a, a, one from my uh, grandpa's favorite comedian, Red Skelton. Uh, I wasn't expecting to see that, but it's a really funny uh, little fun uh, quotation here. It goes something like this. I get plenty of exercise carrying the coffins of my friends who exercise. <laughs> see you guys next week. Nick, give him the wallet. What for? He's got a knife. <laughs> a knife? That's a knife. Thank you.